Lessons 19 and 20 of The Power of Concentration. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Power of Concentration by Theron Q. Dumont. Lessons 19 and 20. Read by Andrea Fiore. Lesson 19. A Concentrated Will Development. New Method. You will find in this chapter a most effective and most practical method of developing the will. You can develop a strong one if you want to. You can make your will a dynamo to draw you to untold power. Exercises are given which will, if practiced, strengthen your will, just as you would strengthen your muscles by athletic exercises. In starting to do anything, we must first commence with elementary principles. Simple exercises will be given. It is impossible to estimate the ultimate good to be derived from the mental cultivation that comes through these attempts at concentration. Even the simple exercises are not to be thought useless. In no respect, writes Dr. Oppenheim, can a man show a finer quality of willpower than in his own private, intimate life. We are all subjected to certain temptations. The will decides whether we will be just or unjust, pure of thought, charitable in opinion, forbearing and overlooking other shortcomings, whether we live up to our highest standard. Since these are all controlled by the will, we should find time for plenty of exercises for training of the will in our daily life. You, of course, realize that your will should be trained. You must also realize that to do this requires effort that you alone can command. No one can call it forth for you. To be successful in these exercises, you must practice them in a spirit of seriousness and earnestness. I can show you how to train your will, but your success depends upon your mastery and application of these methods. New Methods of Will Training Select a quiet room where you will not be interrupted. Have a watch to determine the time, and a notebook in which to enter observations. Start each exercise with date and time of day. Exercise 1. Time decided on. Select some time of the day when most convenient. Sit in a chair and look at the doorknob for 10 minutes. Then write down what you experienced. At first it will seem strange and unnatural. You will find it hard to hold one position for 10 minutes. But keep as still as you can. The time will seem long, for it will probably be the first time you ever sat and did nothing for ten minutes. You will find your thoughts wandering from the doorknob, and you will wonder what there can be in this exercise. Repeat this exercise for six days. 10 p.m., second day. Notes. You should be able to sit quieter, and the time should pass more quickly. You will probably feel a little stronger because of gaining a better control of your will. It will brace you up as you have kept your resolution. 10 p.m. Third Day Notes It may be a little harder for you to concentrate on the doorknob as perhaps you had a very busy day and your mind kept trying to revert to what you had been doing during the day. Keep on trying and you will finally succeed in banishing all foreign thoughts. Then you should feel a desire to gain still more control. There is a feeling of power that comes over you when you are able to carry out your will. This exercise will make you feel bigger and it awakens a sense of nobility and manliness. You will say, I find that I can actually do what I want to and can drive foreign thoughts out. The exercise I can now see is valuable. 10 p.m. Fourth Day Notes I found that I could look at the doorknob and concentrate my attention on it at once. Have overcome the tendency to move my legs. No other thoughts try to enter, as I have established the fact that I can do what I want to do and do not have to be directed. I feel that I am gaining in mental strength. 
I can now see the wonderful value of being the master of my own will force. I know now if I make a resolution, I will keep it. I have more self-confidence and can feel my self-control increasing. 10 p.m. Fifth day. Notes. Each day I seem to increase the intensity of my concentration. I feel that I can center my attention on anything I wish. 10 p.m. Sixth day. Notes. I can instantly center my whole attention on the doorknob, feel that I have thoroughly mastered this exercise, and that I am ready for another. You have practiced this exercise enough, but before you start another, I want you to write a summary of just how successful you were in controlling the flitting impulses of the mind and will. You will find that this is an excellent practice. There is nothing more beneficial to the mind than to pay close attention to its wonderful, subtle activities. Exercise 2. Secure a package of playing cards. Select some time to do the exercise. Each day at the appointed time, take the pack in one hand and then start laying them down on top of each other, just as slowly as you can, with an even motion. Try to get them as even as possible. Each card laid down should completely cover the under one. Do this exercise for six days. First day. Notes. Task will seem tedious and tiresome. Requires the closest concentration to make each card completely cover the preceding one. You will probably want to lay them down faster. It requires patience to lay them down so slowly, but benefit is lost if not so placed. You will find that at first your motions will be jerky and impetuous. It will require a little practice before you gain an easy control over your hands and arms. You probably have never tried to do anything in such a calm way. It will require the closest attention of your will. But you will find that you are acquiring a calmness that you never had before. You are gradually acquiring new powers. You recognize how impulsive and impetuous that you have been, and how, by using your will, you can control your temperament. Second Day Notes you start laying the cards down slowly. You will find that by practice you can lay them down much faster. But you want to lay them down slowly, and therefore you have to watch yourself. The slow, steady movement is wearisome, but you have to conquer the desire of wanting to hurry up. Soon you will find that you can go slowly or fast at will. Third Day Notes You still find it hard to go slowly. Your will urges you to go faster. This is especially true if you are impulsive, as the impulsive character finds it very difficult to do anything slowly and deliberately. It goes against the grain. This exercise still is tiresome. But when you do it, it braces you up mentally. You are accomplishing something you do not like to do. It teaches you how to concentrate on disagreeable tasks. Writing these notes down, you will find very helpful. Fourth Day Notes I find that I am beginning to place the cards in a mathematical way. I find one card is not completely covering another. I am getting a little careless and must be more careful. I command my will to concentrate more. It does not seem so hard to bring it under control. Fifth Day Notes I find that I am overcoming my jerky movements, that I can lay the cards down slowly and steadily. I feel that I am rapidly gaining more poise. I am getting better control over my will each day, and my will completely controls my movements. I begin to look on my will as a great governing power. I would not think of parting with the knowledge of will I have gained. I find it is a good exercise and know it will help me to accomplish my tasks. Sixth Day Notes I begin to feel the wonderful possibilities of the will. It gives me strength to think of the power of will. I am able to do so much more and better work now that I realize that I can control my will action. Whatever my task, my will is concentrated on it. 
I am to keep my will centered there until the task is finished. The more closely and definitely I determine what I shall do, the more easily the will carries it out. Determination imparts compelling force to the will. It exerts itself more. The will and the end act and react on each other. Seventh Day Notes Now try to do everything you do today faster. Don't hurry or become nervous. Just try to do everything faster, but in a steady manner. You will find that the exercises you have practiced in retardation have steadied your nerves and thereby made it possible to increase your speed. The will is under your command. Make it carry out resolutions rapidly. This is how you build up your self-control and your self-command. It is then that the human machine acts as its author dictates. You certainly should now be able to judge of the great benefit that comes from writing out your introspections each day. Of course you will not have the exact experience given in these examples, but some of these will fit your case. Be careful to study your experiences carefully and make as true a report as you can. Describe your feelings just as they seem to you. Allow your fancies to color your report and it will be worthless. You have pictured conditions as you see them. In a few months, if you again try the same exercises, you will find your report very much better. By these introspections, we learn to know ourselves better and with this knowledge can wonderfully increase our efficiency. As you become used to writing out your report, it will become more accurate. You thus learn how to govern your impulses, activities, and weaknesses. Each person should try to plan exercises that will best fit his needs. If not convenient for you to practice exercises every day, take them twice or three times a week, but carry out any plan you decide to try if you cannot devote 10 minutes a day to the experiments, start with 5 minutes and gradually increase the time. The exercises given are only intended for examples. Will Training Without Exercise There are many people that do not want to take the time to practice exercises, so the following instructions for training the will are given to them. By willing and realizing, the will grows. Therefore, the more you will, the more it grows and builds up power. No matter whether your task is big or small, make it a rule to accomplish it in order to fortify your will. Form the habit of focusing your will and all its strength upon the subject to be achieved. You form in this way the habit of getting a thing done, of carrying out some plan. You acquire the feeling of being able to accomplish that which lies before you, no matter what it is. This gives you confidence and a sense of power that you get in no other way. You know when you can make a resolution that you will keep it. You do not tackle new tasks in a half-hearted way, but with a bold, brave spirit. We know that the will is able to carry us over big obstacles. Knowing this despair never claims us for a victim. We have wills and are going to use them with more and more intensity thus giving us the power to make our resolutions stronger, our actions freer, and our lives finer and better. The education of the will should not be left to chance. It is only definite tasks that will render it energetic, ready, persevering, and consistent. The only way it can be done is by self-study and self-discipline. The cost is effort, time, and patience, but the returns are valuable. There are no magical processes leading to will development, but the development of your will works wonders for you because it gives you self-mastery, personal power, and energy of character. Concentration of the Will to Win The adaptability of persons to their business environment is more a matter of determination than anything else. In this age, we hear a good deal of talk about a man's aptitudes. Some of his aptitudes, some of his powers, may be developed to a wonderful extent, but he is really an unknown quality until all his latent powers are developed to their highest possible extent. He may be a failure in one line and a big success in another. 
there are many successful men that did not succeed well at what they first undertook, but they profited by their efforts in different directions, and this fitted them for higher things, whereas, had they refused to adjust themselves to their environment, the tide of progress would have swept them into oblivion. My one aim in all my works is to try and arouse in the individual the effort and determination to develop his full capacities, his highest possibilities. One thing I want you to realize at the start, that it is not so much ability as it is the will to do that counts. Ability is very plentiful, but organizing initiative and creative power are not plentiful. It is easy to get employees, but to get someone to train them is harder. Their abilities must be directed to the work they can do. They must be shown how, while at work, to conserve their energy, and they must be taught to work in harmony with others, for most business concerns are dominated by a single personality. Concentrating on driving force within. We are all conscious, at times, that we have somewhere within us an active driving force that is ever trying to push us onward to better deeds. It is that force that makes us feel determined at times to do something worthwhile. It is not thought, emotion, or feeling. This driving force is something distinct from thought or emotion. It is a quality of the soul, and therefore it has a consciousness all its own. It is the I will do of the will. It is the force that makes the will concentrate. Many have felt this force working within them driving them on to accomplish their tasks. All great men and women become conscious that this supreme and powerful force is their ally in carrying out great resolutions. This driving force is within all, but until you reach a certain stage, you do not become aware of it. It is most useful to the worthy. It springs up naturally without any thought of training. It comes unprovoked and leaves unnoticed. Just what this force is we do not know, but we do know that it is what intensifies the will in demanding just and harmonious action. The ordinary human being, merely as merchandise, if he could be sold as a slave, would be worth $10,000. If somebody gave you a $5,000 automobile, you would take very good care of it. You wouldn't put sand in the carburetor or mix water with the gasoline or drive it furiously over rough roads, or leave it out to freeze at night. Are you quite sure that you take care of your own body, your own health, your own real property, as well as you would take care of a $5,000 automobile if it were given to you? The man who mixes whiskey with his blood is more foolish than a man would be if he mixed water with gasoline in his car. You can get another car, you cannot get another body. The man who misses sleep lives irregularly, bolts his food so that his blood supply is imperfect. That is a foolish man treating himself as he would not treat any other valuable piece of property. Do you try to talk with men and women who know more than you do, and do you listen rather than try to tell them what you know? There are a hundred thousand men of fifty and men of sixty running along in the old rut, any one of whom could get out of it and be counted among the successful men if only the spark could be found to explode the energy within them now going to waste. Each man must study and solve his own problem. Lesson 20. Concentration Reviewed. In bringing this book to a close, I again want to impress you with the inestimable value of concentration, because those that lack this great power or rather, that fail to develop it, will generally suffer from poverty and unhappiness, and their life's work will most often be a failure, while those that develop and use it will make the most of their life's opportunities. I have tried to make these lessons practical, and I am sure that many will find them so. Of course, the mere reading of them will not do you a great deal of good, but if the exercises are practiced and worked out, and apply to your own individual case, you should be able to acquire the habit of concentration in such measure as to greatly improve your work and increase your happiness. But remember, 
the best instruction can only help you to the extent to which you put it into practice. I have found it an excellent idea to read a book through first, and then reread it, and when you come to an idea that appeals to you, stop and think about it. Then, if applicable to you, repeat it over and over, that you will be impressed by it. In this way, you can form the habit of picking out all the good things you read, and these will have a wonderful influence on your character. In this closing chapter, I want to impress you to concentrate on what you do, instead of forming most of your work unconsciously or automatically, until you have formed habits that give you the mastery of your work and your life powers and forces. Very often, the hardest part of work is thinking about it. When you get right into it, it does not seem so disagreeable. This is the experience of many when they first commence to learn how to concentrate. So never think it a difficult task, but undertake it with the I will spirit, and you will find that its acquirement will be as easy as its application will be useful. Read the life of any great man, and you will generally find that the dominant quality that made him successful was the ability to concentrate. Study those that have been failures, and you will often find that the lack of concentration was the cause. One thing at a time, and that done well, is a good rule, as I can tell. All men are not born with equal powers, but it is the way they are used that counts. Opportunity knocks at every man's door. Those that are successful hear the knock and grasp the chance. The failures believe that luck and circumstances are against them. They always blame someone else instead of themselves for their lack of success. We get what is coming to us, nothing more or less. Anything within the universe is within your grasp. Just use your latent powers and it is yours. You are aided by both visible and invisible forces when you concentrate on either to do or to be. Everyone is capable of some concentration, for without it you would be unable to say or do anything. People differ in the power to concentrate because some are unable to will, to hold the thought in mind for the required time. The amount of determination used determines who has the strongest will. No one's is stronger than yours. Think of this whenever you go against a strong opponent. Never say, I can't concentrate today. You can do it just the minute you say, I will. You can keep your thoughts from straying, just the same as you can control your arms. When once you realize this fact, you can train the will to concentrate on anything you wish. If it wanders, it is your fault. You are not utilizing your will. But don't blame it on your will and say it is weak. The will is just the same whether you act as if it were weak or as if it were strong. When you act as if your will is strong, you say, I can. When you act as if it were weak, you say, I can't. It requires the same amount of effort in each case. Some men get in the habit of thinking, I can't, and they fail. Others think, I can, and succeed. So remember, it is for you to decide whether you will join the army of, I can't, or I can. The big mistake with so many is that they don't realize that when they say, I can't, they really say, I won't try. You cannot tell what you can do until you try. Can't means you will not try. Never say you cannot concentrate, for when you do, you are really saying that you refuse to try. Whenever you feel like saying, I can't, say instead, I possess all will and I can use as much as I wish. You only use as much as you have trained yourself to use. An experiment to try. Before going to bed tonight, repeat, I am going to choose my own thoughts and to hold them as long as I choose. I am going to shut out all thoughts that weaken or interfere, that make me timid. My will is as strong as anyone else. While going to work the next morning, repeat this over. Keep this up for a month and you will find you will have a better opinion of yourself. These are the factors that make you a success. Hold fast to them always. Concentration is nothing but willing to do a certain thing. 
All foreign thoughts can be kept out by willing that they stay out. You cannot realize your possibilities until you commence to direct your mind. You then do consciously what you have before done unconsciously. In this way you note mistakes, overcome bad habits, and perfect your conduct. You have at times been in a position that required courage, and you were surprised at the amount you showed. Now when once you arouse yourself, you have this courage all the time, and it is not necessary to have a special occasion reveal it to you. My object in so strongly impressing this on your mind is to make you aware that the same courage, the same determination that you show at certain exceptionable times, you have at your command at all times. It is a part of your vast resources. Use it often and well in working out the highest destiny of which you are capable. Final Concentration Instruction you now realize that, in order to make your life worthy, useful, and happy, you must concentrate. A number of exercises and all the needed instruction has been given. It now remains for you to form the highest ideal that you can in the present and live up to that ideal and try to raise it. Don't waste your time in foolish reading. Select something that is inspiring that you may become in rapport with those that think thoughts that are worthwhile. Their enthusiasm will inspire and enlighten you. Read slowly and concentrate on what you are reading. Let your spirit and the spirit of the author commune, and you will then sense what is between the lines, those great things which words cannot express. Pay constant attention to one and one thing only for a given time, and you will soon be able to concentrate. Hang on to that thought ceaselessly until you have attained your object. When you work, let your mind dwell steadily on your task. Think before you speak and direct your conversation to the subject under discussion. Do not ramble. Talk slowly, steadily, and connectedly. Never form the hurry habit, but be deliberate in all you do. Assume static attributes without moving a finger or an eyelid or any part of your body. Read books that treat of but one continuous subject. Read long articles and recall the thread of the argument. Associate yourself with people who are steady, patient, and tireless in their thought, action, and work. See how long you can sit still and think on one subject without interruption. Concentrating on the Higher Self Father Time keeps going on and on. Every day he rolls around means one less day for you on this planet. Most of us only try to master the external conditions of this world. We think our success and happiness depends on us doing so. These are of course important, and I don't want you to think they are not, but I want you to realize that when death comes, only those inherent and acquired qualities and conditions within the mentality, your character, conduct, and soul growth will go with you. If these are what they should be, you need not be afraid of not being successful and happy, for with these qualities you can mold external materials and conditions. Study yourself. Find your strong points and make them stronger, as well as your weak ones and strengthen them. Study yourself carefully, and you will see yourself as you really are. The secret of accomplishment is concentration or the art of turning all your power upon just one point at a time. If you have studied yourself carefully, you should have a good line on yourself, and you should be able to make the proper interior readjustments. Remember first, last, and always, right thinking and right living necessarily results in happiness, and it is therefore within your power to obtain happiness. Anyone that is not happy does not claim their birthright. Keep in mind that some day you are going to leave this world, and think of what you will take with you. This will assist you to concentrate on the higher forces. Now start from this minute to act according to the advice of the higher self in everything you do. If you do, its ever harmonious forces will necessarily ensure to you a successful fulfillment of all your life purposes. Whenever you feel tempted to disobey your higher promptings, Hold the thought. 
my higher self ensures to me the happiness of doing that which best answers my true relations to all others. You possess latent talents that when developed and utilized are of assistance to you and others, but if you do not properly use them, you shirk your duty, and you will be the loser and sufferer from the consequences. Others will also be worse off if you do not fulfill your obligations. When you have aroused into activity your thought powers, you will realize the wonderful value of these principles in helping you to carry out your plans. The right in the end must prevail. You can assist in the working out of the great plan of the universe and thereby gain the reward, or you can work against the great plan and suffer the consequences. The all-consuming fires are gradually purifying all discordant elements. If you choose to work contrary to the law, you will burn in its crucible, so I want you to learn to concentrate intelligently on becoming in harmony with your higher self. Hold the thought. I will live for my best. I seek wisdom, self-knowledge, happiness, and power to help others. I act from the higher self. Therefore, only the best can come to me. The more we become conscious of the presence of the higher self, the more we should try to become a true representative of the human soul in all its wholeness and holiness, instead of wasting our time dwelling on some trifling external quality or defect. We should try to secure a true conception of what we really are so as not to overvalue the external furnishings. You will then not surrender your dignity or self-respect when others ignorantly make a display of material things to show off. Only the person that realizes that he is a permanent being knows what the true self is. End of the Power of Concentration by Theron Q. Dumont This recording is in the public domain.